Thank you. That beautiful music, I understand, is from Tumimo Horosi, one of our best uh, drummers in South Africa. We bring you greetings from Durban. Uh, this Matama on Sunday live. Today we take it live from Durban. That's where we are. We descended the city with thousands and thousands of supporters of President Zuma. We were here to say hands of Zuma and arrest the clerk. Today we're going to try to deal with some slightly complicated material of interpretation of events. Not just to uh, go to what the media omitted, but what, how do you explain some things, some political developments in the country? We need to develop a framework to understand that. Let's start from the beginning simply saying that over 20,000 people came and stayed with President Zuma. The events of the week included uh, a press conference, which was there, more than 15 organizations that support President Zuma were there. And then we had a night vigil where some uh, matters were explained. And then, of course, on Friday, we all went to court of President Zuma and with more than 20,000 people. None of the media is raising that matter. In fact, if we just to go to the headlines of the bourgeois press, the bourgeois media, uh, if we start with city press, there is consensus on these headlines, you see. And all of them are calculated to make sure that President Zuma is not projected as the man of the people. Because the Friday event, in terms of the number of people coming out, in terms of just how they respond to him and those who support him, show that President Zuma is the most popular politician in South Africa today. And the media's role is to make sure that this is not projected. Let's take City Press. This is NASPERS, NASPERS Media. They say, Zuma fuels ANC war. Zuma fuels ANC war. That is their message. It's not Zuma, but over 20,000 supporters who come out and said, hands of Zuma, is that Zuma is involved in wars of the ANC. So it's a negative projection. If we go to the Sunday Independent, the Jay-Z factor may, may end ANC poll position. Basically, they are saying Jacob Zuma will be responsible if the ANC drops to less than 50%. So they're blaming Zuma. They are again projecting Zuma in a very negative light. Let's go to the big one, uh, Johan Rupert's paper. Sunday Times. Well, it starts with the big story on the front pages. Lawyers demand PIC loan kickback from Zueli. Minister Zueli Mkise is implicated and they're going after him. We thought that Zueli Mkise is their man. Quite clearly. White Monopoly Capital has no long memory, nor does it have loyalty. But an accompanying story says Zuma plots and Rex ANC deal. You see, both of the three main newspapers on Sunday, they said nothing about the support that President Zuma received. They show no images. The most important thing, because I want to, to just see if there are any images that project the, just the volume of the people who are there. Because that impact has got um, important message to communicate about the, if you like, momentum President Zuma is, is gaining. The bourgeois price is, is, is worried, meaning that white monopoly capital is worried. Let me just say also, it was great to see uh, amongst the RET forces who came to stay with President Zuma, Comrade Andre Lungisa, and of course for me, my leader, uh, Shaudi Mutsweni, and then part of Nanalimu Etapili, Abukolibu Pirima, President <laughs> Banga vez, it clean is only a bank of Cassan and Lana, the President Zuma. Oh, good, a South African and Flan, Masculuma, or an amho, the Bank of Tandaga, who will you present? Who present way to Uzu? And the Sergio Wilbur Bessimbona, Mike Mingandolo, 
Entura Lapana, he was in great form. President Zuma was in great form, and that energizes us. I'm going just to remind you now, I'll remind you also at the end of the program that the matter of these charges, I'm going to go into deep into those charges today. But the, the, the matter is being postponed to the 27th of July, and it's not coming to Devon, it is in Peter Marksbeck. We're told it's for pure technical reasons why the matter is being taken to Peter Marksbeck. It's got to do with renovations of the court building in Devon, and that's why it is going to Peter Marksbeck. 27th of July, we have another date. We all must get there. See, white monopoly capital and its agents tried to shut down a program of radical economic transformation. They did not know that they are organizing the masses for radical change. Those masses, again, will be out in court in Peter Marisberg, on Mugundo on October 27, which July. Now, I want us to deal with some facts relating to this case. Because people don't know. You know, I get people insulting me on social media, for instance, saying to me, yeah, you support Zuma who stole money off Nkanda. These charges President Zuma is facing now have got nothing to do with Nkanda, have got nothing to do with his time as president of the country. Just for Nkanda to let it rest, President Zuma actually paid back the money, even as we now know that he was not involved at all in those calculations. It was not 200 million. It was only about 7.8 million rand. Just for the upgrades, certain parts of which, which Pravin Gordon, who was the Minister of Finance at the time, uh, calculated that that's what, what President Zuma must pay. Pravin Gordon doesn't like President Zuma. Pravin Gordon is one of the people who want to see President Zuma in jail. But when he calculated the cost that is due to be paid by President Zuma, he could only come to 7 million rand. It has been paid, as we know. So please, do not come, the media is not uh, helping anyone here because the media is not clarifying these things. The charges that we're dealing with here are charges of the year 2005. President Zuma was not president. It was then Tabum Begi. President Zuma at the time was just an MEC in KwaZulu Natal. And these charges go to do with the arms deal. You know, arms deal is not a provincial competence, it is a national competence. It was, it was the responsibility of national government. Just keep that in mind as we move on. So let us be clear, this matter that President Zuma is going to court for has got nothing to do with anything, nor even a, just an allegation that happened when he was president of the country. And it's got nothing to do with Uganda. Our people don't know, they think that it's, and it's got nothing to do with the Guptas. At the time, if you remember, the Guptas were friends with Mbeki, not with Zuma. So, please, this matter has got nothing to do, and that's what makes it so outrageous. That, in fact, it's got nothing to do with anything that President Zuma could possibly have done. Now, just to, as a fact that we must also emphasize, already two High Court judges have dismissed this case on these very same charges. I want today to introduce the name Johan van der Waals. Johan van der Waals is a senior investigator in KPMG, forensic investigator. He's a for he does forensic work, and he, he heads uh, investigation teams, Johan van der Waals, at KPMG. Remember, they said initially with the media running that story that it was 783 charges. Those charges come from the report done by KPMG, headed by Johan van der Waals. Please keep that name, Johan van der Waals. It's important. These charges of President Zuma, 20, 20, 2005, if you like, to the year 2005, come from a, a forensic report done by Johan van der Waals. Now, Fast track a little bit. We know now that it's not 783 charges, it's only 16 charges, and we know that they've been dismissed before. But Johan van der Waal, this very same chair, is the same guy who headed the investigation against the rogue unit at SARS. Remember, when Pravin Gordon was the head of SARS, South African uh, uh, Revenue Services, he started an illegal criminal organization, a mafia organization, inside SARS. 
That organization was there to harass, to spy illegally against those that white monopoly capital is seen as a problem. That project was funded by the then Minister of Finance and a good friend of Pravin Gordon, Trevor Mango. Now, here's the point. This same Van der Waard was headed a team of, th of, of 30 investigators. And they come with a report that says Pravin Gordon indeed has started an illegal unit inside SARS. Illegal unit inside SARS was started by Pravin Gordon and Pravin Gordon must then be charged for breaking the law. That is a report by Johan van der Waard. Now, here's the thing. Johan van der Waard has got two reports. We must repeat this so that everybody understands. We <laughs> But here's the, here's the interesting thing. These two reports for, for the same from the same man. In report, no one be go loti upravin Gordon when they in his end of Kosaga, no so put him ted. But hey, loyal be go a hot case or quish or gafan part. Go the umbigo look up to President Z, President Zoom call when Zile or Nalumile, but he a quick candle. I will feel a candle, a banana tala eyes will find him out. This is something that even if you don't have to love President Zuma, you don't have to like President Zuma, you just have to be a decent person. In fact, maybe not even a decent person, but somebody who's got a little bit of thinking. How is it possible that the same investigating team, the same head of the team, one report is being said to be withdrawn because that report uh, it implicates Pravin Gordon and they claim that it was incompetent. But the report that says President Zuma is implicated, it's not being withdrawn. Black First Land First has come out, and all people who want some justice have come out to say, you do on the one hand what you've done on the other. Withdraw both reports. That's all we are saying. Furthermore, the interesting thing about this uh, Johan, uh, Johan van der Waard as report is that three independent investigations on Pravin Gordon's rogue unit have come up to confirm this. So it's not just van der Waard, and it's 30 forensic investigators. The evidence is overwhelming that uh, Pravin Gordon is a thug. But because he's an agent of white monopoly capital, he is being protected. Furthermore, a fact that you need to know. Do you know that the South African government is spending, by now, it's spent over 100 million rand, chasing 4 million rand. Because they say uh, President Zuma is implicated in corruption with Shabir Sheikh of about four million rand. About four million rand, they say. Which was little money which has been given over time by between friends. I just want to warn you. If you give your friends money through WhatsApp or something like this, be careful because SARS may be calculating. After 20 years, they come to you and say, but all this money you're giving your friends is about now maybe 500,000 and so therefore you're involved in corruption. Because that's what happened really. Shabir and President Zuma were friends, and as comrades and friends, we help each other. There's no corruption going on there. But we are saying to you now, they are chasing 4 million rand, they have spent over 100 million already, and we are still counting. So, those, keep those facts that this matter has got nothing to do with President Zuma when he was president. This matter has got to do with cases which have been dismissed. Now, I want us to come back to Pravin Gordon again, because Pravin Gordon is a serious player in this whole game. BLF has described Pravin Gordon as corrupt, compromised, and captured. Now, the declarations from Parliament have come out, they published them. So, as a member of Parliament, you have to declare your interests, businesses, and so on. And Pravin Gordon has come out as one who has one of the largest uh, shareholdings. He has shares in 40 top JSE listed companies. 
The important thing, number one, is that these companies do business, do business with government. But I think Gordon has been a minister almost all this time. Now he's a minister of public wow. enterprise. And we know that even in that department, most of these companies do business with government. In other words, Pravin Gordon gets a profit from companies that do business with the state, and this is not corruption. He has, he has shares in all the big banks. Now, here's the important thing. Remember, the big banks are part of white monopoly capital and were fighting with the Guptas because the Guptas were threatening the interests of white capital. And Pravin Gordon basically protected the banks and made sure that the banks, where he's got shares, where he's got influence in the words, shut down the Guptas' accounts in his political battle with the Guptas. So, so, so it is not innocent that he's got these shares and, and, and that he ends there. No, these shares have been used to serve his interest. That is over and above the fact that Lomundu is actually a minister. And I mean, he has shares in media houses as well. If we go back to that rogue unit story, do you know that the Sunday Times fired its uh, editor and fired, in fact, some of the senior investigators who were publishing the story? Because that story of the rogue unit of Pravin Gordon when, it, when he was head of SARS was published by the Sunday Times. And that editor who published at the time has been fired. And even the investigating journalists of Sunday Times who were investigating this story were also fired. Because Pravin Gordon is linked to media ownership, they could do that. I mean, if my friend owns a media house and that media house is writing about me, I give a call to my friend and they will sort out whoever is writing these stories. This is how Pravin Gordon basically operates. And we must say, if go, please go look into those shares. They are available, I mean, the, the declarations. He has shares in things like Remgro. Now, Remgro is a Johan Rupert company. It is a Stellenbosch mafia company. And this company, we know, it does business with government. And we know that the, Johan Rupert is the one who was funding the Zumama School campaign. So you have a minister here who has shares in companies which are involved in the change programs, were involved in the monopolization of South African economy, were involved in campaigns to make sure that radical economic transformation does not happen. Pravin Gordon and Johan Rupert are friends in business. Just like we know his other friend, Trevor Manuel, is a personal friend of Johan Rupert. I was shocked to discover that, in fact, Pravin Gordon's got shares in Steinhoff International. Remember Steinhoff? Marcus Jorste. The guy who the guys who took disappeared about 20 billion now we told from government to corruption. So Pravin Gordon gets a dividend from companies that do business with government. Not only that, they steal from government. And this is all about his own directly involved involvement in acts of corruption. So Marcus Marcus Joster, the CEO who left from Steinhoff, because Steinhoff International said he must leave, uh, is is, is employed by the same Pravin Gordon. Then a British America Tobacco Company, go check it. That is one of the companies that's responsible for cancer, responsible in the African continent to make sure you don't make laws to protect uh, your citizens. I was also very interested to see that this was shared in Naspers. Remember, Naspers is the house that owns, the media house that owns Media 24, City Press, Sweden, and many others. Now, Naspers was formed by the apart just before apartheid, in fact, I think 20 uh, 1914 by the Africa by the Bruder Bond to have a propaganda arm for white supremacy to make sure that apartheid is justified. Now he's got shares there, and it is not a big uh, scandal or a question mark. I was also interested. And that will be the last in the. I'm not going to go through all the old 40, you can find it on, online. But I was interested in BHP Bulletin. BHP Bulletin consumes about 11% of South Africa's energy. Right? And the shocking thing is that, in fact, BHP Bulletin is sponsored by the state because it doesn't even pay what us pay per kilowatt for uh, energy. So here we have a private company, global company, where a minister has shares, and this company has been sponsored by our government 
when we talk about, and on the other hand, we talk about load shedding, and now we're spending 1.3, 1.4 trillion rand to sort the energy problems, but here's a big company which has 11% of our energy almost for free, and Pravin Gorda is part of that company, he's got shares in that company, he declares he gets a, a dividend from that company. It is clear to me that Pravin Gordon's massive shareholding uh, network it has to do with influence more than necessarily now he's getting the money. He's just making sure that white capital has been taken care of and white capital will take care of him as well. And by using his name as one of the shareholders, it means they can basically loot, do crimes, and there's protection. That is, the, that is the bottom line, why they love Pravin Gordon and why Pravin Gordon loves them. Imagine if any minister, imagine if it was Mr. Bentezwani having shares in a Gupta company. Imagine how, I mean, how the world was gonna go crazy. But because it's white capital, we don't see this as a problem. It's a really big, big, big problem. Now, let's turn to something which worries me a lot. And I think it's an evil development in the South African political situation. Julius Malema, Helen Zille don't want President Zuma to have legal fees paid by the state. But now we must listen to this. Helen Zille, we all know she went on Twitter, she went crazy with that, those racist tweets saying, I mean, uh, colonialism is great for, for, for everybody, we must not complain, that's racism. BLF opened a criminal case against Helen Zille. Do you know Helen Zille's case is being paid for by the state? So Helen Zilla is using state money to advance and protect her program of racism against black people. And this is not a problem. Me and you pay for Helen Zilla to defend her program of racism. And then Helen Zilla with Julius Malema together, they go to court and say, President Zuma must not get help, must not be assisted. His legal fees must not be paid by the state. Do you know even apartheid murderers, apartheid policemen who kill people? There's a case right now of uh, Nocturus Melani who was murdered by the apartheid uh, police. Three policemen are appearing before court for murder. Our own court says those policemen's legal fees must be paid by the state. So you can be racist, the state can pay for you. You can be an apartheid policeman who kills members of MK, the state can pay for you. But if you are Jacob Zuma, no, we must not pay for you. Let me go further and just clarify this matter. The agreement between Zuma and the state and Ambedi was that government will pay, and if you lose the case, you will have to pay whatever you used, whatever was advanced to you. You see? But in this case of the of the Zilla or this murderous policeman, whether lose or win, it's fine, we pay for them. Zuma has a deal with the state and Ambeki, which says the state will pay, but if I lose the case, I will pay the state. They don't want even that. We must not think it's just hatred. This is part of making sure that President Zuma doesn't get justice. Because President Zuma must be silenced by any means necessary. So there you have it. EFF walks, talks black, walks white. It says against racism, but it's happy to join hands with racists to shut down their assistance to President Zuma, but say nothing about Helen Zille using our money, state money, to defend her racism, which we all know. Let us also, just, I want to reiterate to all the, those who are watching this program that the reason why they want to shut down President Zuma is because they are worried that the RET project is gaining momentum. And President Zuma, if he goes to court, because these charges are so weak, he will win. But if they undermine his capacity for representation, maybe somehow they might be able to get a conviction. That is the only reason why we see this massive attempt to remove the system from President Zuma. Now, I want to talk about something else, which is Project 2019. Project 2019. This project was designed in London. 
by your, by Robin Renwick. That name will keep coming because Robin Renwick is the man who runs South African politics. Project 2019 basically as a strategic objective is to see South Africa governed by a coalition government of the ANC, DA and EFF under the leadership of Ramaphosa. That will be the best government to take care of the interests of white monopoly capital. So project 2019 is a project that sees a government of national unity. ANC, EFF, DA, so, part of the objective is to make sure that the ANC does not get more than 51%. I mean, it's an, it's an interesting way how they plan their things. So, they will have to significantly undercut the ANC. And this will explain some things that we can't explain in a sense. So, here's the point. If this ANC of DA, EFF, Ramaphosa takes over, on the basis of the designed weakness of the ANC, weakening of the ANC. Because they don't want the strong ANC because they're afraid that Ramaphosa is not strong enough. The RET forces might still take over the ANC and then they'll be able to implement policy. But if we work in the ANC, even if the RET forces come, they'll find that they can't make policy because now all of a sudden they don't have the necessary majorities. So they have a long-term program. Even if they lose power after they have done this, it is not a big problem. Now, this explained one thing which we have not been able to explain up to now. Why are taking Gonyama Trust? No one can explain why is the ANC are taking the Gonyama Trust, why is the ANC are taking the king. But now, if you think carefully about this project 2019 to weaken the ANC, then you understand why they are taking the king, because they know that it's a big voting bloc come from Gazul Natal and it has loyalty to the king. But not only that, we saw even the ANC uh, regional, uh, provincial leadership is being harassed. They're using the courts, they're putting them under pressure, they want them to be angry, and they want to alienate Abant. Ukuze ANC, yes, eh? My third question was, was by Chad ANC, my son is an NTA, and ANC, based on Pay Legal Work, by ANC. Now, now, this is a challenge we must think about, and we'll come back to this issue. Moving forward, because an ANC of Ramaphosa gets 51% plus. It's a dangerous proposition. In the same way that if they get less, they're going to go into their collision and will still be in a dangerous situation as black people. So we have to think through how do we bring the radical economic transformation forces as an electoral bloc. Right now, BNF provides a counter to all this move, a counter to Project 2019. Remember this Project 2019. Its objective is to see a government of the ANC, DA, and, and, and EFF, and that government will be the best government to defend the interests of white monopoly capital. I think, yes, capital in London envisage Ramaphosa as president, Juju, and uh, Maimani as the deputies. In this way, their interests are covered. So, Let's when we talk about what's going on in South Africa, why they're doing things we can't, they cannot be explained, is project 2019. They are busy. I want to deal now with another important development which are things that are happening we can't explain. I want to call it accumulation by crisis. Accumulation by crisis. Uh, I think Naomi Klein has got a book that's called Disaster Capitalism, where she explains in some ways what's happening. This is a brutal bronze strategy. This strategy is very simple. Manipulating an existing crisis or create a new crisis for the purpose of making a profit out of it. And then you blame Zuma and you blame the Guptas for the crisis. And I want to go through some of these crises as examples. Part of this crisis which they create 
to make a profit. It's for instance what they are doing in the uh, state-owned entities. Let's start with education. You know our brothers and sisters were going, fees must fall, fees must fall. Capital looked at that, white monopoly capital looked at that, and white monopoly capital said, how do you make money out of this? You remember President Zuma then had the commission. If you look at the recommendations of that commission, it said to solve the education crisis, give them loans. Think about it. To solve this crisis, which fees must fall, was talking about, give them loans. Where do you get the loans? From the banks. So you see, out of that crisis, you're going to profit the banks. And President Zuma said, no, that cannot happen. That's why he called for free education. This is how capital works using an existing crisis or creating a crisis to make a profit. Let us look at the health crisis. Why is Arun Motswari still the Minister of Health? Something that I don't understand. That man is presiding over a deepening crisis every single day. But it is part of this idea of accumulation through crisis. So basically, Umtwale, Ufuna Uguti, I better la zonge zi masibinzi. Mazi masibinzi is better la zonge, besi butiwa abamfrope, onu wangulu, abangeni, kulenda wa, is a health. Besi ba ezi mali ngoku la wei. Futibo wana futa basu kumisayi nji mkwa. But in Telugu, must be easy to understand. It says, "Guti, when the locals were who more shaka naga, when the Guti buys money out of our desperation or out of our difficult situations." The same with the attack on the economy. The rent, the rent is down. Randa iweleke by sikiti. So the rent is down. It hit about over thirteen rents. I mean, to a dollar. This was the lowest since last December when uh, the NDZ uh, forces, capital was worried that the NDZ RET forces might take over the government and therefore they were taking the rent. But you might ask the question why I take the rent now because their man is in power? It's for a simple reason. They want to attack the rent and the economy to motivate Ramaphosa to move with even faster to privatize. To say, the economic crisis in South Africa and the weakening of the rent is because the structure of the economy is such that, that uh, it is not properly regulated. And what it means is privatized. They see Ramaphosa is not strong enough, he's weak, so they attack the rent to make sure that he moves faster because Ramaphosa has nothing that gives him a nightmare such as a rent which is going down. So what they do, the thing that you really want to protect, you go for it. That's how capital works. It knows that it, this is an investment. Down the line, you will privatize and they will buy everything on the cheap. So, it was interesting that the rent fell so low at the same day that President Zuma is appearing in court. That this attack on the rent, you must call it part of economic terrorism. So what we can say is the following. That as the political currency of President Zuma is going up, the rent is being lowered. But the idea is to subvert, the idea is to subvert the emergence of these radical forces by moving very, very fast into privatizing the economy, into deregularizing the economy, into making sure that the World Bank and the IMF are coming back into the country and taking over our country. That is the plan. So don't think the rent is falling over here as well, Angie. No. My visa is running over Bafun Oguti, low umfowabo. Ura mapos. Agi ji me manje even faster uteni. Umno to we try niko zavam shop. Gongo bachi kuya ni yaboni renda sebets. Yabona ngapa ni umno to kuya ekonomi yao na. Gongo ba au na ufelo eliga ase lo uti ni matutu sa ekonomi. Ufelo la bam shop lo matutu sa ekonomi uti asbani yezi isolated. So, by am Kumbuza again, Joe Babev, Melene, Mabaya, and Nazare, Uguti, South Africa will be in the hands of white people and also happening. Please, every time you see there's a massive economic downturn and white capital is not satisfied with what is held in its hands, it is the manipulation of the rent, the manipulation of the economy for the interest of white capital. What, this thing that we call accumulation through. Um, Crisis. These crises are, are, are made. They are not crises which are natural or because of some kind of uh, 
a structural question outside of their own powers. I want now also just to report to you quickly the news that don't make the news is that the public protector advocate Busum uh, Kweban is under attack. They want her out of that job. I'm sure you've heard last week the parliament was making a lot of noise. Now the opposition parties are openly saying that she must go. The reason why they do this with advocating Kweban is because her sin really was to say Absa must pay back the money. Remember BLF and some of us were arrested asking advocate Julie Madontala at the time to investigate white monopoly capital. She refused. Took her time. But when advocate Mkwebeni came in, one of the reports she, re she released said that Absa indeed did steal money from the public, from the South African Reserve Bank, under apartheid. And it was not just Absa, we're talking about 26 billion rand. They're including your hundred pen and his father, including AMSCO, including Daimler Chrysler and other entities, they stole money from the state. Now, capital doesn't like anybody saying it must account. And advocate Mkwabani was strong enough to come out and say capital, white capital must account. And we know that those who control uh, the South African Reserve Bank, who are all friends of Pravin Gordon and white capital, took advocating Kobani to court to say we don't like the idea that APSA must return the money stolen from us. That's what the Reserve Bank said. The Reserve Bank said we don't like that. Don't say APSA must pay back the money. APSA has stolen that money. APSA can keep the money. The only person who must pay back the money is Zuma, not APSA. And so they were very unhappy. And then of course, remember, she also in a recommendation said that there must be a transformation of South African Reserve Bank so that it's mandate it's now to save the people. They said, well, we'll teach her a lesson. Together with civil society and opposition parties, they went to court and they said that she must pay part of the cost from her own pocket. That is how they do. But they're not satisfied with that. They're still worried that she might still come back with some investigations which will find them uh, guilty and therefore she must be removed. So the big move right now is to remove Advocate Mkwebani. We want SBLF and progressive people to say, all of us, let us defend Advocate Mkwebani, let's tell them hands off, Advocate Mkwebani hands off, let her do her job. In fact, we are all preparing submissions to the Judicial Commission of Inquiry of Judge Zondo. Anyone who's got information, we must go there. We are waiting for them to announce a process where pub the public can submit. We are going to bring boxes and boxes of evidence to that uh, commission. But leave Advocate Mkwebani to do her job. I want to remind everybody that there's a deadline for the submissions towards, you know what they said in Parliament about land expropriation without compensation, the roadshow. Well, on the 15th of this month, which is about a few days from now, that is the deadline. If you want to make a submission to the commission, it's called the Constitutional Review Com I mean, I mean, Committee of Parliament. Please make sure that you make your submission before the 15th of June. BLF is also making its submissions because that's the only way we will be able to go and expose their lies. Uh, BLF says to you, and when they come to your place, I mean, everywhere with this roadshow, we must ask them some of the questions are the following. Why are you coming to ask us whether we want our land or not? Because this is what they're doing. They want to come around and ask us whether we, we must get our land back or not. I mean, it's a silly question, time-wasting a, 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 a process to come and ask us if we want our land or not. We must then ask them if this is not a delay tactic. We must ask them, what is the meaning of unoccupied land? What is the meaning of vacant land? What is the basis of saying black people must take unused or the land that white people don't want? Because both the ANC and the EFF, that is what they are saying about land expropriation without compensation. I think what will be even more important is to say to that committee, Is the EFF and ANC going to make sure that the constitution is amended before the coming elections? If not, then for both the ANC and for EF, EFF, it's no land, no vote. Because they're playing games. So go to the commission, go to the uh, committee, make your submissions, 
but be clear about what you're submitting about because they want to ask you a whole discussion which is meaningless we must ask them very stranded questions the land belongs to us why are you still coming back because remember what i'm saying what we said and i'm going to repeat this there is not going to be any amendment of the constitution before the elections in any event even after that this roadshow they're going to write a report they're going to bring it to parliament parliament maybe will adopt it they'll give it to another committee that committee will have to start all over again and then they'll come back again for another a round of public uh, participation because then there will be drafting there will be a drafting of the bill so right now there's no drafting of any bill in terms of how this uh, section 25 must be amended uh, as we go towards the end i want to talk about the airport renaming scandal was the fraud white capital every time we are united mobilizing towards conferencing white capital they give us a side show, a side show. this naming of of uh, airports is a it's a side show an irrelevant side show black people are fighting amongst themselves about uh, is it uh, uh, Robert Sobuga? No, it must be Winnie Mandela. No, it is Cro I mean, a Croatia. Huh? And so it's a black on black violence on the base. What are you fighting about? Naming airports we don't own. White people are folding their arms and they are laughing at us. And every time we kind of stop from fighting, they instigate us even more. They go get some colored black people and they say to them, You are hard for. Go there and tell them that. Uh, this airport will not be named by anyone, but will be named by a Khoisan person. And then they go there, they fight. And Judas comes to these people, no, it's Winnie Mandela. Now the PAC people come, no, it's Robert Sobukwe. What are you fighting about, people? And now I'm sad to see that they also brought Steve Biko now. You know, and, okay, you people can fight about the names of airports you don't own. Can you just leave Steve Biko out of it? Steve Biko, leave him out of that thing. Because Steve Hugo must still guide us in the fight to retain the land and the dignity of our people, not to fight for meaningless symbolisms such as the airports. But, but I believe that this fight over airports is not innocent as we also think it is. White capital wants us always to fight irrelevant battles. I mean, if we take back the land and the country, we can name whatever we want, the mountain, you can call it whatever you want, it belongs to you. But now you're fighting to name an airport which does not belong to us. What is the meaning of this? I mean, this is the stupefaction of a people. We, our minds basically have been shut down. We just operating like machines which are being manipulated. Today they say fight for this, we fight for that. Another day fight for something else instead of fighting for the only fight which is worth fighting. The fight for the return of the land. Black first, land first. Please, so I'm making a big appeal. Please leave Steve Biko out of it. And I mean, I was very sad to tell the truth when I saw they brought it, they bring the name of Kratua and Winnie Mandela and making these two giants of our, our revolution and resistance to fight. Now we must choose between one, between Winnie or Kratua. Why must that happen? And we're doing this, as we say, in a meaningless renaming process. All people on earth, you defeat the enemy, you bring down his statues and raise yours. You don't start by, by, by just going for the statues, but the enemy is still in control of your territory. It's like most like upside down. You don't start with the statues, you start with the revolution. And then the revolutionary expression of your of the victory finds expression in the new statues and so on, and the name of the country. So now we must have a ceremony to call South Africa Azani, which is owned by white people. It's an insult to those who perished and whose names were abused, including Winnie Mandela. Winnie Mandela did not fight for some airport we name and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and in her name. She fought for the liberation of our people and centering black dignity as a point which expresses the return of the land. We cannot avoid that battle and get a cheap political point scoring thing calling the airport uh, uh, by her name. What some even say it will make white people feel a little bit, bit what, they will feel they will not do not be happy. So you, you are about feelings of white people a little bit, bit unhappy. Not about changing the circumstances of our people and decimating white monopoly capital and white supremacy. We must not play these games with the lives of our people and the names of our icons who suffered so much for our liberation.
Now, I must just, in conclusion, remind you, we have a date on the 27th of, of July. Siam, Basim, Gungundrov, Siam, Pindem, Gungundrov. Bahai, so, can you tell me that July is well happy? Come, Gungundrov, the Copa Hore Loge, the Copa Nangoteng, the Lord Sikhetsa, my Tapiwarona, President Zuma, Kantla Horai, so Hore Pasweu, Bamohatele, the Jana, Kahona Havat, the Hore, the Fatis in Boe, Lena Hai Boe, the economy in Boe. But by Kitty, Sam Kumbos. Como está a 15, que a fonega se soa que está bem, se ele é um mundo. Soba no presidente, o eito da pô, o presidente Zuma. Now, you know, in coming weekend is the 16th of June. 16th of June is the day of black power in South Africa. We remember the 1976 revolutionaries. And also the role of Winnie Mandela there, because it's very interesting when you read the young people, Tieti Machinini, that name is the leader of that moment. Or you talk to Hoto Siasolo, who was the second in charge, really, after Tieti Machinini. All of them were working very closely with Winnie Madikiza Mandela. There's something when I must talk about how she contributed towards the moment of black power. And how the moment of black power 1976 contributed to her understanding of politics, which is different from the politics of the ANC. A good example, and I want you to go and Google and check. See Winnie Mandela's uh, salute, Black Power salute. It is high up. And look at the ANC Black Power salute. It is a 90 degree. It is like uh, the arm is a little bit heavy. And it is not the fist out, pride, defiance against all odds which is the, the, the global symbol of black power. So, Winnie Mandela, in a sense, therefore, she is more informed by black radical politics of the 70s of Steve Biko more than she is influenced by the ANC politics of non-racialism and softness. It's the whole case of black coffee and white coffee, you know, and how Malcolm X says, you know, when you have white coffee, coffee with milk, it is weak makes you sleep, doesn't give you energy, but black coffee gives you a kick. Must be black, must be strong. And this is exactly if you look at those oh, those salutes between the black power salutes that Winnie Mandela represents, and that is the black power salute of the 1976 moment. When Steve Biko was asked about 1976, not about black consciousness in a sense, what is the biggest contribution of black consciousness? He said 1976. Because those children have defeated fear. South Africa all the time has been saved by, by her children. 1976 was a moment when children stood up and in fact embodied the 350 years of the points that our people had resisted and confronted the apartheid system and weakened it significantly. Without 1976, the apartheid monster will still be standing today. I mean, in its all its guises. But those children of 1976, with their black power call, they were able to significantly, uh, for, I mean, significantly confront the, 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 the enemy. I do want you to look at also the, the images that come out. We know that Ubabu Onzim, the one who had the, the, the young Hector Peterson, the picture is always uh, put forward. It's very interesting because you don't see Tieti Machirini and the Tlish Fist guy who was leading that uh, moment. You see Hector Peterson and that picture, which is really a picture of our victimization, not so much a picture of us resisting against uh, the, the apartheid regime. So symbolisms are also absolutely important. We will talk more uh, next week when we remember June 16 about how, for instance, young people who when they left South Africa, were saying black power, when they arrived outside of the country, were met with white uh, commanders. Imagine, you've been saying this country, black power, black power, you were uh, reading all this black power uh, stuff, and then when you go out of the country, you join the ANC, you come to a Caesar, and you know who's your military commander, a white man called Joe Slobo. These are some of the things that we have to talk about because it meant that these soldiers, 
who were radicalized against the white system to go outside of, of the country and they were told that the enemy is not white, the enemy is a system and the system is impersonal and then Joshua was said to the people they must come here and they must shoot pilots, economic installations they must not shoot people who were giving instructions to shoot and kill children unarmed in the townships shoot and kill indiscriminately black people in the townships but Mkondo Esizo was trained by white people that he must only shoot the apartheid military apparatus as if in any situation of colonial occupation any settler is not a legitimate target so we need to go back to 76 and see what 76 provided a possibility for confronting the, the, the whole criminal apartheid system and settler colonialism in South Africa and how white people have corralled our rage and anger away. So all these things again, whether it's name changes, whether it is to, I mean, attacking the Nguyenyama Trust, all these are consistent with the white thinking which we've allowed into the liberation movement and it takes us away from confronting the real enemy. The real enemy remains in this country, white supremacy, and behind white supremacy are white people. It's not impersonal, are real existing people. And the victims of white supremacy are real people, black people like me and you. That will be the edition of, uh, the fifth edition of our uh, program. And we are live out of Durban. And the whole team is descended Durban from Joburg and they've been doing really good work and Devon has been very good to all of us and we love the people of KwaZulu Natal the people of KwaZulu Natal love BLF and we're going to come back on the 7th on the 27th we're going to Ngungunrovu and we'll do the same there until the next episode we say Salani Gashe See you